Hi everyone, hope you're all keeping well. Unfortunately, we can't continue our staying connected theme in person. However, we have recorded another video for you to complete the study. If you haven't watched the first video, it's still available on YouTube, so please check it out. Also, if you haven't got the sheet to work through the study, you can download that from the Instagram page to your phone. This week, we're thinking about why read the Bible. Can you think of any reasons why we might read our Bibles? You might think a reason would be so that God will be happy with me, to impress other people or my parents, or even to make them happy. Or we might just read it because we think that's what I'm supposed to do. These are the wrong reasons. The motivation in each of these reasons are wrong. We don't read our Bible with a bad attitude, but with a thankful attitude, not looking to impress others, but to learn more about God. Here are the two passages from God's Word that we will be studying this week. Psalm 119 verses 97 to 112 and 2 Timothy 3 verses 14 to 17. Please read the passages carefully and slowly. Have a think about the passage and then answer the questions that follow on your sheet. It would be great if you could share your thoughts and answers with the group you normally work with on a Sunday night, possibly via WhatsApp or Zoom. So pause the video now and complete the study. I hope you've taken some time to read over those passages and to think about those questions. And I just want to take a bit of time now to delve into what you've been reading and to talk about in those questions. So the first passage that you are reading was Psalm 119. And here we have some amazing verses that show us just how much the writer loves God's word and how they think about God's word. I just want to take a bit of time to reflect on some of those verses now. So you have then, first of all, verse 97. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. And here we see how much this writer just loves God's word. That's how they describe it here. I love your law. And they think about it constantly. They take time to reflect on it. And then as we read on, we find verses such as verse 103, how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. And here we, hear, we read about how God's word is sweet, sweet like honey to the writer, good for the writer. And they recognise that, that God's word is sweet, that it is good for them. And then as we keep going, verse 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And here the writer describes God's word as something which directs us, which points us, points us to Jesus specifically. And just their amazing verses um, as something that we don't take time to reflect on enough. The idea of God's word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. And then as we go on, verse 111 says, your testimonies are my heritage forever, for they are the joy of my heart. And again, challenging. Um, we had before how the God's word was like honey sweet. And here we have that God's word is the joy of this writer's heart. Um, again, just showing how much they love God's word, how it fills them with joy as they read it. So they love God's law in verse 97. It is sweet to them like in verse 103, it is a lamp to their feet and the joy of their heart. Okay, so you were reading through those verses and then you also were looking at 2 Timothy. Okay, so I'm going to look at that now. So 2 Timothy chapter 3 and funny, we've talked about part of this verse before in Encounter. We've thought about how God's word is God breathed, that it is made up of the writings of different writers but essentially has one author in God and I think yes here I have that page that we looked at in Encounter the last time we got to meet together and this idea of the Bible being one story made up of one story but as I say with one author it is God breathed okay and that is said I think here in verse 16 all scriptures breathed out by God and profitable for for teaching, for proof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. OK, 
Okay, so we know that God's word is breathed out by God and that it is therefore reliable. It is his word. And well, I want us to think a little bit about what God's word can be used for based on these verses, based on verses, I think, 15 to 17. So the first thing um, is that it's used for salvation, that God's word points us to salvation and points us to Jesus and our need of him. The second thing here is teaching, okay? So profitable for teaching. And the idea that God's word teaches us about God and his ways, okay? So it teaches us. Um, also for, and I, my version says here for proof, yours may say for rebuking, but the idea of being able to see what is wrong, okay? What's actually right in God's eyes. And then for, thirdly, correction, okay? How God's word can correct the wrong in our lives if we let it, that we can adapt and change through the work of the Holy Spirit for God's glory and to glorify the name of Jesus. Then we have here, okay, training in righteousness. The fact that we are trained when we read God's word to live in God's, for God's ways and in God's ways, being able to put our faith into action, okay? So for training in righteousness, being equipped for serving God. Okay, so if you want to be equipped for serving God, here you have it, you read God's word. Um, equipping us to be disciples of Jesus and for Jesus. Okay. Um, so you have here, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Okay, so if you want to be an equipped disciple, if you want to be um, someone who can be a witness in the home, at school, at work, wherever you go, okay, then God's word is what enables us to be effective disciples for Jesus. Okay. So from these chapters or from these particular verses in these chapters, we can see how scripture is good for us, how it actually equips us to live for God and um, to bring glory to his name and to serve Jesus. So we actually need to be engaging with God's word if we want to allow it to teach us, to reproof um, or rebuke us, to correct us, to help us train in righteousness, for us to see salvation and to be able to point others to salvation. Um, and it's important to know that, yes, reading God's word, we don't just necessarily read it and have those light bulb moments, okay? And I totally appreciate that um, as well, um, but it can happen. And the reality is we actually have to work at it. When it comes to reading our Bibles, we need to, I guess, get into that habit of reading God's word, becoming familiar with God's word. Um, so just imagine, okay, that you are kind of waiting or, yeah, re waiting for a really important letter to arrive in the post. And you've been waiting all day for it, okay? Um, and when it arrives, you open it straight away. All right, you're so excited. You can't wait to read it. You don't leave it lying in a corner when you've been waiting for it. You go straight for it, you open up. You want to see what it says. Well, the reality is that God's word is, is like that. It is God's word waiting for us to open it, to look at it. And it is so good for us, so good for us. And when we realize how important God's word is for us, we will think that God's word, word is sweeter than honey, okay? Just like those verses we read in that psalm. Sweeter than honey, the joy of our hearts, that we love the law, and it directs our paths, okay? So it's a lamp to our feet. It directs our paths. It shows us God's ways. It shows us how to live for him, to glorify him, and equips us to be God's people, now, there are a few more questions for you to think about from that worksheet, okay? I know that up to this point, you may have looked at the Bible study part here, looking at those passages that we've looked at together, but there are a few more. And it's important that um, you have a look at these. So they are things like, why do you think it is important to read your Bible? What do our Bible reading habits show us about our attitude to God's word? Okay, we've seen how the psalmist responds to God's word. What do our current reading habits, I guess, show about how we think about God's word? What makes it difficult or hard for us to make time to read God's word? OK, 
Okay. And then, if God's word does not shape our minds, what or who will? What or who will? Um, okay, really challenging questions. And before you pause the video to think about those, I want to ask you one more. Okay, and you might want to jot this down or just take a little bit of time to reflect on it. But if this, okay, what we've read here in the Psalm and in 2 Timothy chapter 3, if this is what God's word can do, all right, why do we not read our Bibles? And I'm asking myself that as much as directing it to you. You know, if this is what God's word can do for us, why do we not take the time to read our Bibles? Okay, so take some time, pause your video, and read over those questions. Have a go at answering them. Be honest with yourself. Okay, you're you're alone or you know at home, and you're not with us on a Sunday night. It's a, a real opportunity for you to be honest with yourself. If our minds aren't filled with God's words and God's ways, we're going to get filled with everything else that's going on in the world. So it's important that we read our Bibles. But how do you go about reading your Bible? It's sometimes really, really tricky. So we're going to think of four quick tips on how you can read your Bible better. There's going to be a gap in your sheet that you can fill these in. And this is to help you have better reading habits. The thing is, we're all sinful, which means at times we don't want to read the Bible or often we can't be bothered reading the Bible. And this is because the devil's constantly on our backs, distracting us and telling us we've got to be at everything else apart from reading our Bibles, which is why it's so important that we build up a habit and a structure in how to read our Bibles better. Because if you decided, I'll just read my Bible whenever I feel like it, the chances are you'll not read your Bible very much. So we have to build up a habit of reading our Bibles for ourselves. So tip number one, <clears throat> be realistic. Plan a time in your day to read your Bible that's realistic time frame. 20 minutes a day um, in the morning or the evening or whenever time suits you best. And set aside that 20 minutes and focus on a quiet time. It's far more realistic than two hours every day. Tip number two, have a plan. Have a set time and a place where you can go and you're not gonna be disturbed by anyone. For that period of time it's maybe the likes of setting aside a place that's spe specifically for your quiet time if you have a special place you go to you'll get into the habit of using that place and going to that place and it makes it special for your quiet time and for you and god to have um time alone uh, rather than maybe sitting at the kitchen table which often can be noisy um <sighs> Maybe that also could mean you say to your parents that you're going off for 20 minutes to do your quiet time, reminding your friends or even encouraging each other to do your quiet times and to share what you've learned with each other. If you set aside a time of the day that you are putting your phone away and you're saying to your friends, like, I'm going to do my quiet time now, or try and sync up the times where you do it, that you can all go do your quiet times and then even discuss what you've done um, can be really helpful as well. Tip number three is to stick at it. Once you've decided what you're going to do, stick at it. You need to be disciplined and really stick to it and this helps you build up the habit. If you can keep going, it becomes easier as time goes on. If you start now, before Christmas, you could have a really good habit built up that you'll enjoy by Christmas time and then you can just keep that going and it just becomes part of your everyday routine and part of your everyday health. Tip number four is to mix it up. You don't have to start at the beginning of the Bible in Genesis and then work your way the whole way through the Bible because that can be really difficult. And Bible reading notes can be really good. So it's good to get a range of different books when studying the Bible. Just like in the church, we don't always look at Paul's letters or the Gospels or just things that are specifically good for us at the time. But it's important to get a mix of everything. Um, I found in the past that Bible reading notes like the Daily Bread give you... Um, something from the Old Testament, the New Testament and the Psalms and it means that you're getting a little bit from a few different books of the Bible and you're not kind of trolling your way through and making it really difficult and hard for yourself but you're getting little lessons from different parts of the Bible as you make your way right through. And we hope these very simple tips are helpful. So what practical steps can you take to improve your Bible reading habits and how can you implement these four tips this week? 
Hi everybody. We thought that saying as we all have a wee bit more free time at the minute, um, that it might be a good idea to encourage you to get stuck into not only reading the Bible, but also other good books too. Of course it's more important that you read the Bible, but sometimes Christian books can really encourage us. I'm not a good reader at all. Like I very rarely finish a book. Um, but this book, I just really could not put down. Um, I actually got it from Miss Bingham whenever I was leaving the rainy as a gift. It's called God's Smuggler, and it's the true life story of Brother Andrew. I'm sure some of you have been taught a little bit about Brother Andrew in our Ian school. But for those of you who don't know, then here's a little snippet of what this book is about. Brother Andrew was born in Holland in 1928 and became a Christian at the age of 22. From that moment on, little did he know that he was setting out on an adventure that would change hundreds of lives for God. The book is all about this man's mission of smuggling Bibles into different parts of the world that had very few or perhaps no Bibles at all. Brother Andrew became the founder of the organisation that we know to be called Open Doors. It's a true story of a life totally trusting in God and giving everything over to God in prayer. This book really challenged me to pray about everything. It reminded me that nothing is too big or nothing is too small to bring to God in prayer. And of course, there were so many times um, that you'll see throughout the book that God has answered prayer so specifically that it will leave you just more and more in awe of God. Brother Andrew had one prayer that became pretty famous. It was this. Lord, in my luggage, I have scripture I want to take to your children. When you were on earth, you made blind eyes see. Now I pray, make seeing eyes blind. Do not let the guards see those things that you do not want them to see. Why not pick up this book? There are two copies outside church in the box. Um, and to see yourselves how God answered this prayer. It won't disappoint. So hello everyone. Exciting mystery guest this week, I know. Um, thanks uh, David Bingham for the, for the nomination. Um, I'm just going to take up two minutes um, of your guys' time um, just to share um, my story. So who I am, um, where I'm from and what school did I go to. So as all of you guys know um, my name is Jonathan. I'm uh, an encounter leader for two years now. I'm in my second year. I grew up on a farm between Desert Martin and Macrofelt and went to Desert Martin Primary School and then on to the, the Rainy in Macrofelt, which I absolutely loved. Best years um, of my life. So when did I become a Christian and how did it happen? Um, so maybe some of you guys know, Catherine will definitely know, I have a terrible memory, like it's shocking. But I do remember the night that I asked Jesus into my heart. So it was the Sunday, the 20th of February, 2000. Um, and whenever I was, uh, whenever I was kind of writing out some notes, I was thinking that's, that's 20 years ago, that's such a long time. And whenever you think about it, that's actually longer than, than most guys, actually it is longer than than all you guys can kind of been alive, like most of you guys weren't even born in the year 2000, it makes me feel so old. Anyway, so I was brought up in a Christian home. I went to school, went to church, um, went to Sunday school, went to Holy Bible Club, all of that good stuff. But that night something really just clicked with me. I don't remember anything about the sermon, but I do remember a lady singing. I don't really remember the song. But I do remember it It had the repeated line, where we spend eternity. And that really struck me. It really stuck with me because in that moment, I didn't know where I would spend eternity. I didn't know where I was going to go whenever um, I died. So that night I, I prayed and uh, I gave my life to Jesus then at the age of seven. So any challenges or difficult moments in your faith? Um, so throughout primary school, everything was was good. Um, at the at the rainy, um, I fell in with a, a great group of friends. Um, I had quite a good 
group of Christian friends as well. Um, really enjoyed the, the SU in school and everything. And to be honest, life wasn't really difficult in school or church or at home or in my walk with, with Jesus really for, for many years. But then um, whenever we were on holiday in 2009, um, on the way over to England, which we went to every year, <clears throat> mum took sick and we had to come, we had to come home. So to cut a long story short, um, it ended up that she had a cancerous tumour and she, she needed treatment. Um, so it was really difficult to see mum go through all that, to see her in bed. So you're so tired to see the effects of, of chemo and everything on her as well. Um, but my, my friend's mum um, actually kind of went through something similar. Um, she'd been healed, so I guess like in the back of my head, I thought that God was going to heal mum too, I guess. Um, but mum actually passed away shortly after my 17th birthday on the 11th of December 2010. Um, and that period was was really really difficult um for for me for um for my family um but looking back on it now it did give me a real dependency on god um it drew me closer to him um in the months and in the and in the years that followed and lastly what's god doing now um so recently we've been looking at church in church and especially over this harvest period um, of God's faithfulness and looking back on on my life from you know when I give my life to him right up to now God has been so good and and so faithful um, you know countless times yes there have been really challenging really painful times like I just mentioned um, but looking back on it you know um, I I you know, loved school, got, got through school, got to Queen's, graduated from Queen's, um, began working in a, a law firm in 2016, uh, got married last year, um, have now got a puppy as well. Um, so yeah, God has been, has just been really good and, and so faithful um, to me down through the years. Um, and I'm just going to finish this short video um, with, with my favourite verse, which is found in Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. And it's trust the Lord with all thy heart and don't lean on your own understanding and always acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. So I would encourage you guys to just keep looking to God um, to keep leaning on God um, because he is a faithful God. Thank you. Hi everybody, I am here to tell you a little bit about me, my life and my journey with God. So it's the best place to start is at the beginning and tell you a little bit about how I became a Christian. For me, there are kind of three standout moments in um, how I became a Christian. Firstly, when I was about seven or eight, um, I remember going to GB and we were learning about the motto of um, the Girls Brigade, which is seek, serve and follow Christ. And I just remember sitting there being totally amazed as the leader explained that Jesus wanted to have a relationship with me. And at that point, I knew that it is something that I was definitely interested in, but just pushed it to the side at that point. And then probably fast forward a few years to when I was 13 and 14 and just remember being really interested and really wanted to find out more about Jesus and about God. Um, but when I was 14, I had to take a bit of time off school because of extreme fatigue. I, at that point, I was just starting my um, GCSEs and was completely run down and totally exhausted. And some mornings I found it very difficult to even get out of bed. And at that point, I knew that I needed to rely on God and I felt very strongly felt God's presence at, at that point. But it was kind of the start of a journey that I began to really want to find out more about him and I remember being very curious and asking lots of questions um, and especially at your fellowship in my old church in Moneymore um, asking lots of questions and really wanting to find out 
more about him. Um, but then during my GCSE, so I would have been, my GCSE exam, so I would have been about 16. Um, I remember our church organised for us to go to a PCAI youth event in Belfast and there was a band called Remission Flow and they were leading the praise and the worship and then they sang a few songs on their own as well. And one of the songs was called How Deep Is The Father's Love and um, sorry, the song is called Father's Love. The first line of the song is called How Deep Is The Father's Love For Me and the phrase for me was repeated throughout the song and I don't really know how to describe it but I could remember feeling that God, every time God was speaking to me at that, that point and every time that for me was sung, I just knew that God was asking, well, have you made your decision yet? Are you going to trust me? And I knew that I had a decision to make whether or not I wanted Jesus in my life. And while it sounds something that's really easy, for me, it was quite a hard decision because I knew I had to completely surrender to him and to God. Um, but I can tell you that is honestly the best, the best decision. And it's completely true. And that point at that night as well, they also talked about, um, John 10, verse 10, which is, um, I have come to give you life and life to the full. And that's totally what it is for me, what it is to have Jesus in your life is to have life and have it to the absolute full that you know he is always with you. Um, so in summary, very quick summary, that's how I became Christian. Um, but what is God teaching me now? It's not just a one off decision. It's, um, a relationship. And I really tr truly believe that God is teaching me to rely and trust completely on him. And that is something I do find quite difficult. Um, especially this year when life hasn't been normal um, and from March time I have found it very difficult to kind of be at home and not have normal normal life and um, I love being busy and I love being out and about um, but I truly believe that God is just using his time to teach me to be still to trust him and to rely on him completely and there's one verse I want to share with you and it's been really speaking to me throughout this whole year and it's been Matthew 11 verse 28. Come to me all who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest and I just think that's so important that God is always there to turn to um, and but also with that God also gives us life and life to the full. Thank you, hope to see you all soon. Bye.